Bibles, uh, you can open Isaiah chapter 1. If you're following along in the bulletin, there are sermon notes, or if you're using the Bible app on Version, you can go to the menu in the events tab, and you will find our sermon notes there as well. But I want to start by introducing you to a symbol. This is a symbol. Did you know that? Did you know that a symbol can be used to make beautiful noises? You can play a nice, smooth jazz beat. Right? Something like that. By the way, if you're a kid in here, <laughs> you were dismissed to go to your classrooms right now. My goodness, two services in a row, Ray. What, what am I going to do? It's even in my notes. Yeah, right. When we add a third service, I'll get it wrong three times in a row. That's good. All right. So did you know a symbol can be used to make beautiful noises? It can also be used to make... Sensory warning. If you do not like loud noises, now would be a good time to cover your ears. It can also be used to make not so beautiful noises, right? Uh, that's why you would, you know, you'd never want to just give your kids one of these, hand them a drumstick and say, here you go, okay? That's the idea, and uh, how you play it makes a big difference. So with that in mind, I want you to think about this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in human or angelic tongues, but I don't have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all the faith so I can move all mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. And if, if I, uh, it's lost my place. If I give away all my possessions, if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I not only am nothing, I gain nothing. Here's the idea Paul gets at. Religious activity or religious behavior that is not motivated by or expressed in love is useless to us and obnoxious to God. And God's reaction to it is the same way as if someone just beat on that symbol repeatedly. At first, maybe you'd show them a little grace, but give it 30 seconds, give it a minute, and what's your reaction gonna be? Cut it out. I'm fed up. I don't want any more of it. That's exactly the way that God responds to religion that is not motivated by or expressed in love. With that in mind, let's go to Isaiah, where we're going to pick up in verse 10 of chapter 1. We have said in weeks past that Isaiah's book is like a 66-chapter masterpiece on who God is, his desire to save, and how he intends to save his people. And in weeks past, we've talked about how God, first of all, needs to save us from ourselves. And this week, we're going to read about how Isaiah tells the Israelites that the next thing that God needs to save them from is their religion. God needs to save his people from bad religion. And so starting in verse 10, we read this. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Hey, good morning. How are you? Right? What are all your sacrifices to me, asks the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, or male goats. When you've come to appear before me, who requires this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of solemn assemblies. I cannot stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They have become a burden to me, and I'm tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse even to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered in blood. 
what Paul says about symbols seems pretty tame compared to what Isaiah says to the people of God. It's fair to say whatever was going on with the clanging symbols in 1 Corinthians, that's what's going on here, except to a greater degree, Isaiah criticizes everything about the people of God in their religious system. He criticizes, first of all, their sacrifices and their temple worship. Then he moves on and sacrifices the, er, and uh, criticizes their festivals and feasts. And lastly, he criticizes their individual prayers. This covers pretty much every area of the way that the people of Judah and Jerusalem would have worshipped in Isaiah's day. He's taking shots at every area of their worship. Imagine today if Isaiah came down the aisle at church and said, hey, listen, I've got a few pieces of advice. First of all, your music. I hate it. Cut it out. Second of all, the preaching. It's obnoxious. It's atrocious. Tell that windbag to be quiet. Also, your life groups. You're just going for the snacks. Go join a Zumba class or something. It would be a better use of your time. Oh, and don't bother taking communion anymore. It's not accomplishing anything. Oh, is that all? Put yourself in the place of Isaiah's audience and imagine how personal that would feel. Imagine how offended you would be. Who, who are you? What gives you the right to say those things to me? Man, how devastating would that be? Like, God, are you serious? And here's the kicker. God says to the people of Judah through Isaiah, who requires this of you? I have to imagine their reaction would be a lot like ours. Like, are you kidding me? You did. Who required this of us? I mean, God, are you joking? This is supposed to be for you. We're doing this because you asked us to. This is stuff that you told us to do. We're just doing what you told us. Isaiah says, exactly. Here's the problem. What God had given them as a privilege, they saw as an obligation. What God had given them in order to bless them had become something mandatory to go through the motions. Yes, God had commanded them to observe all those things. It was his temple after all, but God did these things as a demonstration of his grace to share himself with them. What was the point? That God wanted to actually know them. He had given them ways to interact with them. He said, I want you. I've saved you. I care for you. Here are some ways to worship so we can have a relationship. It was an act of love, an act of grace, and yet their religion had become formal rather than faithful. Doesn't that sometimes happen? Our worship becomes a box to check, becomes formal rather than something done out of love for God. And so God started to see it as an annoyance, like someone leaving their shoes on and getting mud all over your carpet. They were trampling all over his courts. They came in to get their business done and they got back out like going through the drive-thru at the bank and nothing more. Their walk with God had become a formal transaction. And if we can take away one very clear lesson from Isaiah about how God feels about that, it's this. God rejects transactional religion. He hates it, in fact, is how it's described. If we actually get into the language that is used by Isaiah in this text, the word hate that Isaiah used actually means my soul hates it. A translation into modern English might say something like this, I hate it with all my heart. When people are just going through the motions just for the sake of it, and I never get their heart, and I never get them, God says, I hate it. I hate it with all my heart. I'm fed up with it. It's just a clanging Symbol. God hates transactional religion. So it's best that we understand what it is and how we can be healed from it. Here are a few things that I think uh, are characteristic of, of transactional religion. First is this. Isaiah pegs them for sacrifice without repentance. They come into the temple. They offer sacrifices and yet there's no repentance, there's no sorrow for sin. As an act of compassion, God had given them, think about this, God had given them a way that if they violated the law and sinned against him, they had 
recourse. They had an option available to them. They could come to the temple and offer sacrifices, and God made a way for them to be restored to right relationship with him. That was an act of love. They would come in and offer an animal, and the blood of the animal would be offered in payment for sin's penalty. Sinful people who were repentant and were grieved over their sin and desired mercy for God could come in and say, God, I'm desperate for mercy, and you know what God would do? He would give it. But there's no point in a sacrifice if the one who brings it isn't repentant. Religion becomes transactional when we go through the motions and we think we're doing God a favor. Here's something that's important to know about God. We can bring God nothing that he needs. Did you know that? We cannot add anything to God. We believe in a God who is complete. Okay, the word for this is he, is, he has aseity. He has being and completeness and fullness in himself. He doesn't need anything from us. Therefore, here's the good news. God does not love you on the basis of what you can give him. Right? God does not love you on the basis of what you offer him. His love is not conditional. Here's the thing about God. God never loves in order to obtain something selfishly. Why does God love? God loves simply because he's loving. It's who he is. That's why he's worthy of being worshiped. It's only humans that give love conditionally in response for something selfish. God doesn't act that way. That's not who he is. And so when the Israelites come in and they offer sacrifices and yet there's no repentance, there's no sorrow for sin, not only is this something that God dislikes, it's actually something that Jeremiah says robs God of what he deserves. Jeremiah says that they've taken the temple and they've turned it into a den of robbers where they come in to take his blessing but never offer him pure and contrite and repentant hearts. Here's a sign of transactional religion, okay? If, you're, if we're assessing this in our own lives, if we come to offer sacrifice, right? We, we don't come to offer animals on Sunday, right? But when we come together to offer sacrifices of praise on Sunday, is there ever godly sorrow in your life? Is there ever repentance and grief over sin? That's a sign of a healthy relationship with the Lord. If there's never repentance or godly sorrow in your life in response to having grieved God with sin, then that may be a sign that you're in danger of transactional religion where your body's going through the motions, but your heart isn't. The second characteristic of <clears throat> transactional religion would be this celebration without holiness. And if you were a Hebrew in Isaiah's day, let's say this, you would have had a busy church calendar. Okay. You would have had a lot going on. Um, you think we have a lot going on now with all the different stuff going on at church, but within the Old Testament law, God had set aside a number of holy days and celebrations for the people of Israel. Among them were seven major feasts that were celebrated every year. In addition, they observed sacrifices and mandatory rest days each month on the new moon. And then, in addition, their weekly celebration of the Sabbath, not to mention other calendar features like the year of Jubilee, which was celebrated every seventh year. And this was hard work. You think getting the kids ready for church and getting here on time is difficult. Imagine packing up the donkeys, getting the kids together, and walking to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices, right? It, and no minivans back then. It would have been a little bit more difficult, right? And we think sometimes we can get in the kind of the mindset where we grumble and complain about the things that we're doing. But imagine putting yourself in their shoes and all the different things that were going on and how easy it would have been to fall into grumbling and complaining. But they forgot why God put these things in place. God put these things in place for their benefit. Why did God ordain feast days and celebrations and rest for his people? Well, first of all, to help them commemorate to help them remember who he was. This is the God who loved them and acted first. He had saved them. He put those things into place so that they would constantly be reminded of his loving care. He put them in place to help them commune with one another and with him to foster a sense of unity and identity together. He put them in place to teach them, to help them understand the cycle of sin, judgment, repentance, and mercy. He put them in place to help them have hope, to look forward and understand the role of the Messiah that was gonna come. And lastly, this is so important because I think we forget it, God put them in place simply to bless them with joy. These were celebrations. God wanted his people to experience joy. 
They didn't gather out of obligation, and we don't gather today because of obligation. All of those same reasons why, are why we gather. We gather to remember Jesus Christ. We gather to be unified together in the Holy Spirit. We gather to be taught together from the Word of God, to look forward with hope because of what Messiah, the Messiah who has come, Jesus Christ, has done for us, and to experience joy together. Here's the deal. How can you recognize transactional religion? It makes people miserable. You will not find joy there. See, the type of brand of religion that God endorses is not miserable. Joy abounds. And the last characteristic of transactional religion is this. Piety or religious habit without love and justice. God says even their prayers won't get them anywhere. Why? Because their relationships are broken. Because they'll come and say one thing when they're in front of God, and then they'll go out and live another way in their relationships with people. And so the idea that we get from this is they're destroying each other. They're devouring one another. There's brokenness in their relationships. And the health of our worship, this is important to note, can in some ways be measured in how we treat one another. If the relationships among us are broken, it's a good indicator that our worship is suffering because those two things cannot be separated. If we take those three things together, here's what we could understand about transactional religion. Religion becomes transactional when the form is emptied of its intention. What's missing in all those things? They look great on the outside. They're good things. God ordained all of them. What's missing on the inside? All of those things have become rotten. It's like when you go to the refrigerator, how many of you ever grabbed a carton of milk and it looks great on the outside? But you open that baby up and you take a whiff. Or this is how God punishes people who drink from the jug, right? You go to take a swig and what is on the inside is completely different than what you're expecting from the outside. And so when, when we think about transactional religion, what's the effect? Something that's supposed to be beautiful and joyful and abundant and pleasing to God. Something that's supposed to bring him pleasure. It brings him pleasure to bring joy to his people. And something that's supposed to bring him pleasure and glory instead is rotten from the inside out. That's the idea. God doesn't desire it. He doesn't accept it. And it accomplishes nothing. It can't do anything except make people miserable. And so then it's good for nothing except to be tossed out like spoiled groceries. So here's, here's what you'd ask. And are you saying that if my heart's not in it, God doesn't care? That's not what I'm saying. That's what scripture is saying. In fact, Isaiah would take it further. Transactional religion will end up on the compost pile of eternal insignificance because it gives the appearance of life, but offers none. So then we'd ask this, well, what the heck does God want from me? What the heck does God want from me, right? If jumping through the hoops isn't good enough, if doing all that isn't good enough, what does he want from me? That's the wrong question. See, that's the question that gets us into this mess. It's not about what God can get from you. It's about what he's already done for you and wants to do in you so that he can then work through you. Isaiah gives us the recipe. He then gives us an idea of what God wants. If we move on to verse 16, he says, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight, stop doing evil, learn to do what is good, pursue justice, correct the oppressor, defend the rights of the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Come, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. We have often said that Christianity isn't a religion. It's a relationship. I'm not here to poo-poo that or in any way, but here's what I'd suggest as an alternative. What God desires is pure religion. God desires transformational religion. The religion that God desires is transformation in his people. We could say this today. The answer for bad religion isn't no religion. It's pure religion. The kind that transforms people. 
See, it's not that the sacrifices and Sabbaths and all that stuff and the new moons and the prayers were bad on their own. They were God-ordained. They were beautiful. But here's what was supposed to happen, that every time they would gather together and come together, that they would encounter God's goodness. And as they encountered God's goodness, they would be so transformed and so changed that they would then become his goodness to the rest of the world. That it would lead to repentance, to integrity, to justice, to goodness. God wanted to accomplish a personal transformation with, that started within them and then spilled over among them. It started with transformed individuals. Isaiah says, cleanse yourself, stop doing evil, learn to do good. Those are individual commands. But then that transformation doesn't stop inside. It spills out into relationships and into communities because the last three commandments are relational. They're for the community. He says, pursue justice, correct oppressors, defend the vulnerable, plead for the weak. So then if we ask then, what then does God want to do in us and through us? It's simple. He wants to transform you. He wants to transform you to be cleansed, to stop doing evil, to start doing good, and then to work through you then to bring goodness into all of your relationships so that it spills out into the world around you through justice, through care for the vulnerable, right? All of those things. And then what does that look like when a whole community of people starts to live that out? If we became a community like that, what would it look like if we lived that out in a church community? If God accomplished transformation in us and then accomplished transformation among us, what does God desire the church to look like then if we're looking through Isaiah's eyes? It might look like something like this. In a transformational community and not a transactional community, here's what happens. People are washed and cleansed by Jesus. People are getting baptized. Lives are being transformed. God is writing testimonies and stories as people are hearing the good news of Jesus, hearing the gospel, and seeking him and following him in faith. In a transformational community, evil is abandoned. People are laying down sin and taking up God's way of living instead. In a transformational community, people are learning to do good, and goodness is contagious. They're learning to do good and are practicing it. In a transformational community, justice rules and abounds. Things are made right between people. Broken relationships are restored. Families are mended. And vulnerable people are cared for and defended. Let me ask you, my friends, how many of you would like to be a part of a church community that's transformational and not transactional? How many of you would like to be a part of a church community in which people's lives are transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ, where they lay down lives of sin and take up lives of goodness, where we see vulnerable people defended and justice restored among people? And wouldn't that be just the kind of church that the world needs? I think so. And why couldn't it start here? Why couldn't that happen here? It's simpler than you think. See, here's the deal we need to understand about worship. Worship is a whole life project of being transformed. What does it mean to worship God? It means to let him transform you over the course of your entire life. We get the choice, though, whether we want church to be like a line at the DMV or whether we want it to be like a wedding celebration. Which one would you rather be a part of, right? The difference is really simple. Here's what Isaiah says in verses 19 and 20. Here's the key. Underline it, highlight it, circle it. If you are willing and obedient. That's it. Two words. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But Isaiah warns the people of Israel. He says, but if you refuse and rebel, rebel, you will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There is joyful abundance in a community where there's transformation. And there is transformation in a community where people's hearts are willing and obedient to Jesus Christ. Because the aim of transformation, what does God desire above all else to do in us? The aim of transformational religion is a transformed heart. That's it. It's not about the sacrifice itself. That was never the point. One of my favorite scriptures comes from Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, which says this. Lord, you don't want a sacrifice or I'd give you one. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. 
something that we have to understand about the way that God operates is that a value, the value of a sacrifice is not in the thing itself. The value of a sacrifice is in the heart of a giver. This is why Isaiah can say that an expensive, costly, fattened calf, which maybe doesn't mean a whole lot to us because we're not used to that, right? But put yourself in Isaiah's day, and that was an animal that was bred for sacrifice. They were the best of the best, right? And the fatty part of the sacrifice was supposed to be the good part, right? And it represented a good offering. Isaiah says even the fattened calves, the best offerings that, that are offered with a cold and religious and unchanged heart mean nothing to God. But here's the counterpart to that. Here's the beautiful opposite, that even the smallest sacrifice, the smallest gift that we offer with a pure, genuine heart of love and affection for God is precious in his sight. Did you know that? Even our weak imperfect offerings that we come to him and bring, if we bring them with hearts of faith, they're precious in his sight. How many of you have ever run quality control on the artwork your children bring you? Who cares about the quality? What you care about is the heart of the one bringing it, right? That's the father's heart for you. He will never refuse someone that comes to him with a broken, humbled heart. Did you know that? He's never done it before. And he's certainly not going to start with you. So here's what that means for us. When you wake up on a Sunday morning and things are overwhelming and just getting to church is a battle and you're struggling and you're conflicted and in the midst of what you're feeling, you gut through it and just with every ounce of strength you have, you're able to just barely muster up the will to sing even in the midst of what you're going through. Did you know that that's a beautiful sacrifice to the Lord? You don't have to be Pavarotti, right, to impress the Lord with your singing, right? Even our weak, poor, imperfect offerings are good and pleasing to him. Did you know that when you make the decision to go and volunteer and take care of little kids in the classrooms and you think, well, man, what's that going to accomplish? Did you know that when you do that out of a heart to love and serve the Lord and honor him by caring for the ones that he loves, that that's a beautiful sacrifice to him and it's precious in his sight. The principle applies to every area of life, my friends. The value of the gift lies in the surrender of my heart. And that brings us then to the last part of this passage, which is so important. And I think it's the high point of the whole passage. It kind of builds to this. Their worship in Isaiah's day has been transactional. They've been guilty of coming to worship while walking in sinfulness and injustice. They come in the door, they go out the door, and they're no different. And so God tells them, go and wash yourself, cleanse yourself, and come back willing and obedient. But there's a problem with that. What's the problem? How do they do that? How do they get cleansed? How do they get washed? How do they find new desires? If I want my kitchen to be renovated, I know where to go. I can go to Home Depot. If I want to make some tweaks to my truck or do some modifications, I know I can go to the auto parts store. If I want to transform my wardrobe, I know that I can go on Amazon and have it here tomorrow. But if I want a transformed heart, where do I go? Where can I go to get a new heart and new desires and get washed clean from within? Just tell me what type of detergent to use, Lord, and I'll give it a try. Here's the problem. The one thing God wanted was the one thing they could not produce, which was a transformed heart. None of their sacrifices could produce it. None of their sacrifices could produce permanent change. That's why Hebrews tells us this in chapter 10. Since the law was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. What's he saying? The same sacrifices offered and over and over had the same problem. They could never make the person offering it perfect. They could never do it. They weren't perfect sacrifices, right? Right? Going on to verse two, otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. A sacrifice itself could never bring about transformation in our inner person. 
because it was imperfect. So here's the problem. We need a perfect sacrifice that can not only cleanse us and wash us, but completely restore us and transform us in a lasting and permanent way. Who's the only one that can provide that? God himself. I hear you whispering it. Man, that's a beautiful sound. You guys know it. So God makes the ultimate offer. It's the most incredible offer imaginable, and he makes it to all of us. Here's his offer. He says, okay, go cleanse yourself. Okay, that's not going to work. You can't do that. How about this instead? Come, let's settle this. I love the way the ESV says it. Hey, come on, sit down. Let's reason together. How about this instead? How about I do the washing? How about I do the cleansing? In Isaiah's day, they probably thought that sounded like a metaphor, but we know differently today, don't we? We know that God has done something. He has provided a permanent way for us to be cleansed and washed of our sins. And not only that, but to be transformed and given new desires and created as a new creation. His name is Jesus. God sent him into our world willingly to lay down his life to die on the cross so that his blood could be provided for our cleansing. And now that sacrifice is the power of salvation for anyone who will accept his offer by trusting in him and him alone. Today, if you accept his offer, it's for you. There's no longer any sacrifice necessary because God has done it and he's offered it to you through Christ. And if you'll accept it by grace, through faith, you'll be transformed. See, transformation happens when our hearts are changed and our desires are replaced and that can only happen by the power of the Spirit of God. You can't do it yourself. Our last takeaway today is this. Only the perfect sacrifice of Jesus can transform our hearts. It was a perfect sacrifice. It was a now and forever sacrifice. It will never stop working. There will never again be sacrifices. What incredible good news is that? So don't settle for transaction when God offers to us through Jesus transformation.